really um, get people involved in the conversation. You know, I think what we're going to talk about today is something that is, um, you know, our challenges that, you know, at least I'm not going to claim that I figured them out. Um, mm-hmm. But I think they're, they're issues that we all, all face and have our own unique perspectives on, on tackling. So I think we're going to be really excited to hear some of, some of your stories and, and see if we can add that to the, to the mix. So please, yeah. please chat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I mean, to, to add to that too already, like one of the things I had on sort of my list to touch on is, right, like you don't solve for inclusivity overnight, right? It's an ever going, ongoing process as your products grow, as you get new types of users in, as you expand to different regions, right? Like there's so many ongoing hurdles depending on what stage of maturity your product is in. So, you know, don't be sort of disheartened for like where your product might be now if you don't think it's where it should be because it's an ongoing iterative process that just grows uh, day after day. Definitely, definitely. Um, yeah, so we're about, you know, we're about to hit the four minute mark being in here. So maybe we can start off with, um, with intros. Um, Mike, do you want to talk about your background and, and, and what you're up to? Yeah, I'll kick it off. So yeah, I'm a first generation Dominican. I was born in Santiago de los Caballeros. Um, that's where my family's from. My family, my mom was born, my mom and dad are from Baitoa. If anyone knows DR out there, you know, representing the chat, let me know. Um, and yeah, we, we moved to New York when I was about six years old. And I basically, um, I've been working in tech for about 15 years, the last 15 years, um, which is basically my whole professional career. Um, and I have a really untraditional background as to how I've gotten in product. Um, I did graduate with a computer science degree. However, I, didn't, I didn't, didn't go and sort of become an engineer. I just, I kind of did computer science and I honestly knew I did not want to code. And I knew that right out of college, um, but it really taught me um, the ways of like critically analyzing a problem and breaking it down into subsets of smaller problems that you can then solve sort of piecemeal. Um, and so my background has really kind of been all across like operations, vendor management, program management, uh, support and partnerships, then ultimately leading me into product marketing and then product management. And, you know, with that sort of like untraditional sort of path, I got to say, like, the one thing that's been super valuable is that with all of my external facing and operational experience, I think it's really strengthened my listening to users, bringing in user empathy in relation to building products, um, and then actually the execution piece, right? Because operations tends to be very well known for execution. So um, not only sort of thinking at the high level from like building a product out, it is, is it the right solution for the business um, and for its users, but then also being able to dive down and sort of um, solve at the right level. Um, just to close out right now, I'm actually getting my master's in counseling psychology. Um, my goal for that is to do some work with the, with the Latino community and support them in whatever ways I can with relation to mental health support. I think that there's some avenues there for me with relation to mental health and tech that overlap and is becoming a big trend in the market at this point. But then secondly, also actually doing client facing work, being a therapist and doing that one-on-one work with with our community, hopefully. So that's me. What about you, Ricardo? I'd love to hear about you and your background. Yeah, that's that's super awesome. I'm really excited that you're still, you know, taking that learner's approach, you know, li- you know, somewhat late in your career and then trying to see how you can apply new skill sets and, and new perspectives to tech, which I think, you know, actually ties into the topic really, really well, right? Um, so uh, my name, you know, my name is Ricardo Martinez. I'm from Puerto Rico. I was born in San Juan. Um, I lived there until I was about 11 years old when then I moved to Miami um, and I spent um, high school and some college there. Um, I also had a little bit of, an, of a non-traditional story in the sense that, you know, I started programming when I was very, very young. Um, I just somehow got sucked into computers and, and, and found out that I really wanted to code. So a little, a little different there, but, you know, I, I just fell in love with it. And, and, you know, I feel very, very blessed and fortunate that I was able to turn, you know, what I saw as basically a hobby as, as a child into a career. Um, so when I was actually at college, I was attending um, Florida National University in, in Miami. And um, I ended up finding this opportunity to get into the startup space in, in New York, which is a city I've always dreamt of living in. And I kind of just, you know, took the opportunity, dropped out of school, and then and, and the rest is history. And, and, and I've been um, working professionally, um, mostly for small businesses and scaling startups. 
um, to kind of like midsize um, for the last uh, 12 years. Um, and I think what's interesting about, you know, sort of like my path in, uh, getting into programming um, young, but also, you know, having a little bit of, of an entrepreneurial mindset is what I what really got me into startups is um, how important it is to be product minded, user centric, empathetic, you know, all these values that I think are very critical to building products that actually solve real problems for real people. And mm -hmm. that part of, of, of the of the, you know, I guess like industry is something that surprised me and how much I was going to really um, enjoy and, and get into and become passionate about. And, you know, um, my, my, my roles have been primarily on the tech side, but, you know, I've, I'm now a CTO and, I, and I've been able to get into that, I think, because of, you know, my desire to want to work closely with product people and building teams that are very cross-functional, um, where engineers are working directly with product um, directly with designers and even talking to users. And I'm really passionate about making sure that those teams have that cross functionality. Yeah. Yeah. You know, kind of like, as you were mentioning that, right? Like, I feel like there's definitely pieces of the Latinx culture that really values that really lend themselves to this type of work. Right. There's that um, kind of like, I, right, I think that that cross functional piece that you're mentioning with relation to right product managers are historically known for just having to be ex extensively cross functional, um, and I think that right that kind of, that to me in my mind plays that sort of like familismo idea that that Latinos have right where right you're just used to being around this like large group of family members friends always sort of like coming together and having to sort of navigate right these many different types of interactions um, and then secondly too is that like that personalismo that comes in with being Latino too, right? You kind of just like, like you and I haven't met before, but right, like it's like, there's a warmth, there's a sense of yeah. like, <laughs> there's a sense of care that comes into it. Um, that I think sometimes, you know, like I, as Latinos, like sometimes we tend to forget the, that those strengths that sort of like are innately a part of us, like can really be brought in to this day to day. And when you leverage them and if they connect with you in the right way, like, you know, can be, you know, bring about really great success uh, professionally. Just wanted to shout that out. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that, especially with, um, you know, the, the care piece, you know, like I find that my family in Puerto Rico are some of the most caring people, you know, that I know in my life. And, and, and they basically make that a part of, you know, who I am and, and my culture. And, and I love sharing that with everybody that I work with. But I, you know, especially living in New York City, which is an incredibly diverse, you know, city that, that you know, does have its issues, too, with bubbles. There's a lot of bubbles, actually, in, in, in New York um, and, and communities that are a little bit siloed. And, and I think, you know, that's going to play into some of the things we're going to talk about. Definitely. Cool. Let's so yeah, maybe we should start running through some of the, you know, um, and I and I totally, Gerardo, I totally hear you on the, you know, the printers and, and routers I've had to restart. And, <laughs> and, you know, I think I feel like I got a lot of yep. IT skills being a kid, just, just, you know, being, being that person. Definitely. To this day, it still happens. No matter what company I'm working at, if, if anyone has sort of like used that product, they'll be like, oh, like, how do I do this? How do I do that? <laughs> um, Always. And I love helping, you know, like, like, yeah. it, it really does feel very, very, you know, satisfying to be like, you know, um, help someone kind of like reach what they were trying to do, even if it's something as basic as get online or something as mm -hmm. complex as, you know, um, learning how to cook for the first time, which is something that product that I worked on back yeah. in the day. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we had a little bit of an agenda here. I think the first thing was just talking about ourselves and, and, and a high level summary. Or I guess yeah. we should talk about where, where we're at right now. So, Mike, do you want to start sure. with what you're working on right now and what you've worked up to most recently? Yeah, definitely. So right now I'm at WhatsApp. I'm a project manager here. Um, and, you know, I'm still I, I joined the company three months ago. So I'm still sort of figuring out the lay of the land and what I'm up to exactly. Um, but we're I'm on the I work on business integrity. So that specifically, as we're scaling out our business messaging products, how do we make sure that um, we're doing it safely? We're doing it in sort of like the most, um, you know, looking for both good and bad actors and bringing in the right signals to support each of those areas, um, making sure no one's being spammed, scammed, et cetera. And, you know, like it, I, I got to say with relation to like our talk today, um, you know, I, I've been at many large companies and I've been at one startup, you know, I've been at Google, I've been at YouTube, I've been at Meta and all these different companies. And I gotta say, like, I think WhatsApp is like the first company that I've seen just be so broadly inclusive with how they build their product. Um, so one, I'm really excited to be, to kind of share a little bit about that today, but also, um, you know, like it's just really astounding especially because it's a product that's so close to a lot of us i imagine right? like i know my family uses whatsapp day to day 
in their interactions, right? Like my, I, I have a year and a half old son. We still have a lot of family that's in the Dominican Republic. WhatsApp is the way that we're video chatting with them, that we're, um, you know, sharing videos and photos that they're seeing my son grow up, right? And so that's taken really strongly to heart and a part of the DNA of how we build our products. Um, and, you know, including ensuring that it's accessible to anyone and everyone with a mobile phone versus just those with the latest iPhone, right? That's one piece about sort of inclusivity that I think sometimes get, gets forgotten is that accessibility piece also. Um, so that's what I'm doing right here right now. Um, but yeah, but I mean, for the last, I would say six years, it's probably been a lot more product focused work that I've done both in product marketing as well as product management. Um, it's mainly been on the social media side of things. So I've supported um, launches on Facebook video for content creators, um, as well as YouTube, as well as Instagram. That's kind of been um, a lot of really figuring out how the products that I'm shipping are going to land with product market fit. And I'm happy to talk a little bit about that later today, because I think, right, like you can't, you can build an inclusive product, but you also got to make sure, right, it's meeting the business needs and actually has a market to sort of use it, right? Um, so, you know, you kind of do that through a lens of, uh, of establishing a product market fit for your product. Um, and that, that was honestly, that's been my most favorite part of the work is just doing that user empathy, really understanding the market, and then seeing how do we translate that into something that actually then we get into their hands. That's awesome. That's really, really cool too. Cause I mean, you're totally right on like, basically like all of my family is on WhatsApp now. And, and you know, the, the fact that that includes also like my, my 82 year old abuela, like, you know, and then she exactly. knows how to send me pictures and like, you know, she would text on it and, and, and stuff like that and, and do the calls. Like it's just a testament to how integrated it is and, and how families communicate around the That's world, right? International right? families, especially. Exactly. Yeah. Like, yeah. like Karen just said, like, you know, she communicates with her family. Yeah. Go ahead. I don't, yeah. Um, yeah, tell, tell me a little bit about sort of on your end, like what you're doing and how it touches into the products. Yeah, so, you know, I've been doing, you know, startups for the last 12 years, which is, you know, every time I join a new startup, I think like, oh, this is the last time that I joined a startup. I'm not doing this anymore. But I guess I'm a little bit of a masochist and I just keep, you know, finding like a new crazy challenge. Um, and I think what I like about it a lot is that it allows me to touch many different industries and, and verticals and get experiences in, in different areas. And I think that's one of the great things about being in engineering is, you know, pretty much every industry now needs some sort of like software developer, some so, someone to lead their software. Um, so most recently, I just joined a, a company called um, Line Leap, and they're basically like a nightlife kind of like, you know, company they do. They're trying to basically, you know, um, make transactions in the nightlife setting a lot more efficient right now you're still putting down like a card and you're still mm -hmm. you know it's a very inefficient process and it's very stressful for bartenders and i think we're trying to solve that that sort of like um stress but you know i've worked in everything from health products to, to food products um education products you know kind of like you know all over the place and you know I, I i tend to really like being in positions where i um, am able to transform um you know sort of like you know where a startup that maybe has found some product market fit and and they figured out that there's a market for it but they don't really know how to turn you know how they work into a system that works effectively for scaling right yeah. um and what i mean by that is you know just like where do ideas come from and then how do you manage those and turn them into releases that are actually effective and that are solving real problems um mm -hmm. i think that's a really really big key is like you know a lot of people have lots of ideas you know ideas are a dime a dozen um, but like really picking the ones that are going to make the biggest impact on the most people and that are actually solving the real human and like emotional problems that they're facing. I think that's yeah. where people get tripped up. Um, and a lot of startups fail when they don't, when they're unable to build that empathy. Um, and I think inclusion becomes a really big part of that too, when you're trying to hit mass market. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I love that idea, right? Where it's just like, it's then, you know, like you're mentioning empathy a lot and like, right. As I mentioned earlier, like, it's like, I'm getting my master's in counseling psychology because right like it's so like cool. for, there's been such a connection there for me with relation to what I do day to day especially with relation to building products for users that just right it's like you're, you're trying to understand like what are the behaviors that this individual is trying to take out in the real world and how can I make that easier for them less stressful for them right all of these things that can sort of touch into that that psych angle a little bit that just um you know um is, is what gets me really excited about the work that I do with, with relation to building products yeah that's a great segue into what the next question was going to be, which is why we're so excited about this topic. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I think you kind of touched on it already. Do you, do you want to add a little bit more to that? Or Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's definitely that, that, that's one piece right there, you know, and, and 
to like to start it off like i mean like like i mentioned earlier like building a successful product period is super tough like you know like this is what you know this is this is why startups sort of like go through the churn that they do this is why startups have massive pivots this is why even larger companies like set up and then deprecate products within six months um right because the actually the building of it right is is one piece but then the actually understanding how to like achieve something that has product market fit that's truly meeting user needs um is a whole other one right and you know especially you not even sort of considering the fact that it's like building one that's in successful and inclusive as well right um you know and inclusivity can mean a lot of different things dependent on where your product is and what it's doing for someone, right? Um, you know, you can bring inclusivity into a B2B product, right? Business to business, like an enterprise product. What does that look like? That might look like inclusivity for various types of businesses that maybe wouldn't have access to the type of um, scalability and efficiency that you're bringing into your product, for example. Um, like, right, there's, there's so many different ways that it, you can sort of play off of that idea of inclusivity. Um, the one thing I will touch on that sort of gets me excited about it and the one thing that always jumps to my mind when I think about inclusivity is identities, right? The identities mm -hmm. of each individual that you're serving as a user, right? Like it's like my, as part of my identity, like I'm a male, I'm Latino, I'm Dominican, um, you know, like and so on and so forth, right? And your users also have those same level of granularities around identity that, you know, if you can find a way to kind of like touch and sort of empathize with the various identities of your users and bring that into your product, I think that that's like the really exciting place where you're then actually having them feel seen while they're in your product. Like, like right, like that's like a whole other level. So, oh, hey, we have someone joining us here. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, you know, that, that's what gets me excited about this kind of work is just really thinking about inclusivity from a level of identities and intersectionalities, right? We can also call that like user personas as a part of it too, right? There's so many different sort of phrasings that, that are used sort of throughout the product space that connect to that. Um, and that's the kind of stuff I love to dive into and then see how I can translate that into an actual product that gets shipped. Yeah, I think I think that's so true. And, and that kind of bleeds into the, you know, what I think gets me really excited about this topic and just product management in general, which is talking to people, which I think that that's, you know, one of the only ways that you can really sort of like understand what are the different identities of the people who are interested in the problem that you're trying to solve, because you may or may not be solving it for them. And I think, you know, t really talking to people um, is the only way that you're going to get into those perspectives. And I think even taking it a, spec a, a step further, I think making sure that internally that you have a diverse, you know, staff. Mm -hmm that's working on this problem, you know, as best as you can, is going to help you tap into those individual identities and, and, and differences in how people speak more effectively than just doing user research, right? You can do like all the user research you want, you can collect all the data that you want, but I think, you know, having people on your team that come from different walks of life um, is gonna be one of the best ways and being open-minded about that and, 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 you know, using that as a almost like competitive advantage is one of the ways that I think, you know, is most important to me as far as building inclusive products and i think a lot that with hiring you know because um and especially on the engineering side like hiring is, is is really hard right especially for the those like you know sort of like unicorn skill sets that everyone's like really looking for but i think actually yeah. if you start opening your you know your uh, perspective on what it is that you really want to bring in um to your team with with experience or background or whatever um you know i've i i found that some of the best ways to build inclusive teams is actually to focus on you know making sure that you have a good platform for training and being really open to hiring entry level engineers and and stuff like that because you know that's where you're going to get the most most diversity um if you're trying to change you know sort of like the makeup of what's historically been in in, in tech teams um mm -hmm. and it's a lot of fun you know like i think you know talking to people from different walks of life and 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 um you know having junior people to to grow and watch them grow and eventually become senior engineers um, is, is, you know, a very rewarding part of, of my job, at least as, as a CTO. Yeah. And I also think too, like, right. Uh, the, that part of sort of bringing in, uh, right. More junior sort of developers and engineers. I think also there we're at this really interesting time, right. Where at least like personally, like, right. Gen Z, I feel like is the most aware of the various identities that are across our world and sort of most tapped into, 
that also, you know, like I feel like plays into that strength of bringing in folks, right, who are diverse, but also have that exposure to very diverse ways of thinking, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, not to say that older generations are like more traditional or anything, but you, that, that tends to play out a little bit sometimes, right? And so it's like ensuring that you, you no matter what line of generation you have or type of thinking that all of that is being brought into the room as a way to like find out how to make it the most inclusive and sort of diverse as possible when you're actually building something and ideating on something to build something. Totally. Um, and I think that's a good, you know, transition to the next question, which is, you know, how would we define what actually is, is an inclusive product and, and, Mike, I'm curious how you would, you know, yeah. sort of define it if you even can, you know, because I'm sure there's a lot, like you said earlier, there's like a lot of different ways to look at it. Yeah, I, I mean, right. At, at, I think of it as like one accessibility, right. Um, and that can be accessible in like a lot of different ways. Like it, it can be accessible through its design and making it easy to use. Um, it can be accessible to making it easy to use for sort of anyone with various types of disabilities or, um, you know, like inabilities to do certain types of things such as like like eyes or sort of vision or hearing or whatever the case might be so to the senses, et cetera. Um, but right, also making it accessible and sort of warm to no matter what culture you're a part of, no matter um, what generation you relate to, no matter what gender you're connected to. Um, right, because I, I think what that does is that it then allows that even if that product is meant for, this is like super top of mind for me right now for other, many reasons, but like, let's say it's like, it's it's an app that's being built for people who want to do beatboxing and rapping, right? Um, right, like the, that, that's a very specific group, but if you can make it inclusive enough that like no matter who it is, it's going to come in and just try it out and just really be entertained by it versus like really focusing it, focusing it in on one particular demographic or user type like right that's just that's just going to bring a whole new level of like creativity and like just more more fun to your product right like i mean for the most part um you know you want to make sure that your product is bringing some sense of emotion to those that are using it positive emotion right and you know i think that that accessibility piece is looking across all those different angles when i think of inclusivity too i think of safety so right mm -hmm. like especially as someone going into counseling psychology, as I'm developing products, I think a lot about frameworks like human-centered design, um, safety, safety by design, um, trauma-informed design, all of these different types of aspects that sort of come into play where your person is landing on your product in so many different states and from so many different sort of lived experiences, right? How can you ensure that no matter how they land on your product, it's going to be welcoming and accepting of them in whatever state it is that they're in. Um, so those are the two angles, like the accessible piece and the sort of like the, the safety and sort of like psychology angle is what I think about when I think about inclusive products. What about you, Rick? And I'm going to have to like move really quickly because my charger isn't like charging up quickly enough. So let me find a quick room, but I'll let you go ahead and shoot it off as I do that. Okay, no problem. I'll, I'll stall for you. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, yeah, the safety thing is, is a really good point and, and something that I think um, people don't you know often think about. Um, I agree with your points a lot, Mike. So just to add on top of that, I think, you know, um, making sure that people don't feel excluded as far as their identity, I think is really important. Um, you know, and I think you have to be really careful when developing product to make sure that, you know, you're, you know, going back to talking to a lot of people, um, you're involving as many people as you can to get as many diverse points of thought, because you might end up in a situation where you might, you know, get surprised as to what kind of demographic actually ends up wanting to use your product. And that's something that actually happened with my last startup. We were building a, um, a travel, a group trip, you know, planning tool. Um, and, you know, we'd have conversations internally about like, oh, you know, like we really need to target like Gen Z or we need to make sure that they're really excited about the product. And, and, you know, that's the way that we're going to scale. And like, you know, there might be some truth to that, but I think what was really interesting about when we um, did a kind of like a soft launch of our product and we just put our, our product out there, focusing on SEO, making sure that we're just finding people who are looking to solve this problem, no matter who they are, right? What are the keywords? And what we found was that actually we have a lot of, um, later generation people that were finding our product 
you know, surprisingly, we were trying to build for this like young, cool, like, you know, whatever. And it turns out that the people who are the most passionate users were people in their 50s and 60s who their kids had just gone off to college. You know, they're, they're, they have no one at home anymore. They've got lots of friends they've developed over the decades of raising their kids and they've got money and they're ready to travel, you know? So we thought we we're going to get all these 25, you know, year old birthday trips, 30 year old birthday trips. And like, no, we're getting 55, 60 year old, like, you know, like milestone trips. And, and, and they're, they really want this to work. Um, so I think, you know, having that open mind to it um, and just doing a lot of research, like will surprise you as far as like, you know, what kind of like demographics and identities end up relating to your product. And I think that's really important is to like, make sure that, you know, the problem that you're trying to solve, it's very likely that even if you have an existing demographic, um, that's really passionate about it, you know, ultimately they're not going to be the only ones having that problem. And you got to make sure that your solution doesn't make, you know, people who are also interested in it excluded from it. Um, and you can only do that by, by talking to them and getting real reactions from them. Yeah, no, that's, that's such a great point. And, you know, two things to add to that, right. It's, um, you know, you touched on this a little bit is diversifying your marketing channels, right. Because, right, that's sort of like along the like you don't know who you're going to reach and who your product is going to necessarily connect with unless you're marketing right. in a lot of different places and kind of seeing like what's who it sticks with, right? So, even that unto itself is its own sort of way of like testing out these various marketing channels and trying to see, like, okay, like what who does it stick with and how do we adapt the product as we're seeing sort of traction in different sort of um, demographics and user personas, right? Um, and then the second piece too that you kind of mentioned was um, that sort of came to mind for me was like building for the most common denominator is kind of like the way that I've heard it phrased. Um, I forgot who it's coined, who coined that term, but right, it's like the idea of it might have been in relation to like the way the iPad was built, where it was around the idea of like right not building it for like necessarily like the latest generation but building it for like your your grandma or older generation that may not be as tech tech accessible right so building right. for that most common denominator because then right as you're starting from that most foundational layer you're pretty much building it for everyone else right successively exactly yeah and that's exactly how we sort of approached that last startup too um it's just you know making sure you know when, when we look at how many people out there, you know, are struggling to get their friends to, or family together to go on trips? Mm. I mean, that's universal, you know, and, 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 right and you know, the marketing message has to apply. Yeah, exactly. Like it's just everybody. Right. And that message applies to everyone. And, um, you know, the AB testing thing that Oscar's bringing up is interesting because that's definitely one way to iterate our marketing message. Um, but I think just like understanding who it's, who it's appealing to and making sure that, um, you know, you might want to have different messages. I think for us, the thing that was most successful is just, you know, targeting really, um, we weren't targeting a particular demographic, but we were highly targeting what would someone with with this problem Google? And and that's what we found out the most. It's like, you know, that's how we get in their faces. And then, you know, it was pretty pretty much agnostic to, to, to what age, you know, what generation, what identity, you know, yeah. you have. Yeah, to kind of like to speak to that, I mean, one thing that we've done uh, before we even found product market fit and we were just ideating and trying to figure out a particular problem we were trying to solve for content creators um we knew that that was like the sort of the main group but there you know content creators are, are so many and so different there's gamers there's vloggers there's those who are more musicians right there they kind of span across different areas and what we actually did was that we used a b marketing testing as a way to see which message landed most closely with individuals as a way to verify this is like the type of product that they're looking for so almost used like, and that was because like we had a, a bunch of other sort of barriers that were in place. So we were trying to get creative with trying to understand our market. Um, and, you know, it was, it became super useful because we, it literally was like, as we did like a, a test car across three, like there was one message that just like was what people truly honed in on. Mm -hmm. And that was what we ended up seeing. Like, oh, these are the types of features and sort of solutions that you, these type that the content creators are looking for um, with, um, with what we're trying to build into, for example. So, you know, using, using all these various me methodologies, frameworks, and trying to also just get creative, right? Because your company is going to be at different maturity stages, have different level of resources, have even different levels of access to actual users to do research with. Like, I've been there where I've never had, I haven't had any, any users to research with because we were just starting off from the start, right? Um, you know, like trying to use all these different sort of frameworks and try to get really creative with how you use them to figure out your product market fit. Again, like I'll keep coming back to that over and over again. 
Definitely, definitely. Um, you know, just to kind of like you know, involve the, the the group a little bit, we talked about yeah. wanting to ask people if there are any you know problems that they're trying to that they are currently facing at their companies or with their startups. Um, as far as trying to make their products more inclusive, so I'm just going to put that prompt out there and, and and invite the chat to to maybe you know throw some topics or problems that they might be facing in there, and and, and we'll definitely get to you. Um, so I mean. We've kind of touched on this already, but but just to like, you know, kind of like check off the question, you know, the next one was, you know, why is inclusivity in engineering and, and building products so important? Um, we've, we've touched on that a little bit already, but, you know, maybe if you can answer that one just directly. Yeah. And so, I mean, I think for me, a lot of it is to write, understand sort of who your users are and then also like how to make it, make your product as diverse as possible across those user sets. Um, right. Cause I think a lot of times, you know, and, you know, having been at various startups and companies like, right, there's, there's a lot of already inner known expectations as to who we're solving for, like, right. People love to have all these assumptions as to their products. And I think as a product manager, like your first sort of goal and your first, first sort of line of responsibility, I think is like testing assumptions, right. Testing folks' assumptions and just really being the person who's like, well, why is that the case? Like, do we have the research for it? Do we have the data for it, right? Um, and so for me, it's always taking that step back and just thinking, sure, we're solving, you know, our product is supposed to be solving this problem for this particular set. One, is there a way I can expand that set out, that set of users out, right? Because the more people we can bring onto our product, the more success we're going to have, right? Um, but then also, how can I just make sure that whenever anyone, whoever it is that is landing on my product, that they're feeling that sense of being seen and that they're being represented right. in the product, right? Um, I think that those are, that that's at least, because, you know, like I've had products where it's like you use it and you're just like, oh, like this is like so sticky and works for me. Like that's that's the phrase that, that does it for me is like when I use some, something and it just like, it sticks with me, right? And that's the product that I end up telling people about. That's the product that I go back to day to day. That's the product that I end up leveraging for other creative uses outside of what it's specifically been packaged for, right? Um, and you know, you want that for your users. Like you want those power users. You want those users that get creative and get real excited about what it is that you're building. Right. Yeah. You almost, it's that feeling of like, you know, this product figured me out. Yes, and like, you know, exactly. you, you get me and, and that gets me so excited. And then I start telling everyone else because, you know, then I start projecting, right? It's like, oh, you must be like me. <laughs> I feel like you will understand this the way I do. Yeah. Um, and, and you've got to use it. And, and like, it's funny because, you know, I have so many, um, you know, my, my, my coworker and I, um, we trade apps all the time. We just started working with each other. So now we've yeah. got, got like this whole list of apps and he's got this whole list of apps that we just trade because we found out that our identities as far as like, you know, trying to get the most out of our bodies and, and whatever are, are the same. Um, so yeah, once you get that feeling that that the product just like gets you, like, you know, what market, you don't need a marketing budget as much as you thought you need because like people just start like spreading the word very, very exactly. naturally. And, it, and it's never, it's never demographic or identity. Well, maybe identity in the sense of like, you know, um, cause identity also goes in, in, in many mm -hmm. different ways. Like, like, you know, identifies as Puerto Rican, identify as millennial, identify as male. Um, but I also identify as someone who likes biohacks, I identify as someone who like, you know, listens to podcasts, I identify as someone, you know, that likes, you know, that wear wearables <laughs> to them right now, like embarrassing. Yeah, yeah. But, um, you know, so, you know, finding those people, it's never, um, you know, you want to make sure that you're relating on the identities that they're going to care about and that you care about and not on the wrong ones, right? Because I think some people, you know, who are, you know, get really good at solving a particular problem, when they market, they're just like, oh, I want to be really, really cool with this group of people. And it's like, you know what, maybe 75% maybe of that group doesn't actually care about your product. And you're, you're, you're excluding a whole other, you know, set of people that, yes. you know, if you just made, if, if you weren't trying to be so cool, you know, in, in, in that sense, you would actually be relevant, which I think is way more important. Um, so, you know, as far as like, why is it important? I think for me, it's, it's twofold. The, the first one is obviously just from a business standpoint, like, you know, I want the, my company that I work for to be successful. I want it to grow and I'm leaving people out and I'm basically, you know, making growth harder by doing that. So, so number one, that's the sort of like, you know, business angle of it. But number two, I mean, you know, this is a lot more personal to me, but I just like relating to people and, and, and finding how people can relate to me and, 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 you know, learning about them and, and stuff like that. So when I, 
if a product doesn't make someone feel included or feels exclusive, then I'm not doing that part of what I love about my job well. Um, so that's how it's, in, you know, there's sort of the angle of why it's important to the business and there's the angle of why it's important to me. Um, exactly. And, you know, I think that's important to bring in, bring into your day to day as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, definitely. Right. Like it's like whatever ways you can, like you can bring your level of authenticity both to the individuals you're working with, but also right the products that you're building. Um, right. It's only going to come out better for everyone in the long run. I mean, you know, I've, I've also done work and been in places where I've been building products that I'm like, this just doesn't connect with me. This doesn't thrive with me. And, you know, like they're, they're just you can feel that mismatch. And, you know, like those are the moments where I think we've all been where at different points in our careers where we're just like, let's transition to something else that feels more in alignment with like who you are, with your strengths with your value, again, like the values piece and the things that you truly connect with, right? And yeah. I think sometimes that comes across in products when we see, right? Like it's very common in the space, especially in social media for folks to copy off of one another. And you can, you know, like you can sometimes sell when people are shoehorning, sho like just like forcing certain products or features in when you sort of are engaging with it and you're like, oh, like, this like navigation feels a little clunky or a little force or, you know, it, it comes out to your user very quickly, just very intuitively, right? Users are a lot smarter than I think um, a lot of folks tend to give them, give them credit for. And, you mm -hmm. know, we need to build for them on that intuitive level. Absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, part of the question was also around, you know, not just building inclusive products, but I think, you know, the, the, the teams that build them, um, and, and I'm curious how this resonates with you, but as, as you were talking, I was thinking about it. Um, just the, um, the, the building teams that are going to build these inclusive products, like they need to be inclusive and diverse in and of themselves. And I think when it comes to the values piece, which you said a couple of times as you were, as you were speaking, um, you know, it, it's it really, I think, starts at the top of organizations, like especially when they're very small, you know, like having that bind at the top as far as like making sure that you're going to build something where they're going to want to target, you know, people who want that problem solved as opposed to targeting a particular demographic. Like, you know, I think it's really important to understand whether or not you have that buy-in at the top. And if you don't have that buy-in at the top, you know, in, in my experience, you know, not, not to be discouraging, but can actually be really, really difficult to change. Um, because, you know, I think, you know, certain C-levels and, and CEOs will have a certain vision about how they want to build. And, and if that vision doesn't include inclusivity and empathy, um, you know, I've been in situations where I've really thought that I can, I can make big change and I haven't been able to because they yeah. just didn't have that buy-in. And, and ever since those experiences that I've had, like, you know, I've learned to go out there and actually, you know, interview the people that I'm going to work for, you yeah. know, as far as if they're going to have that set of values or not, because if they don't, then I just know that I'm not going to be compatible there, you exactly. know? And, and trying to force that compatibility is, is very difficult and, 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 and sometimes just borderline, you know, impossible. And you have to wonder whether it's worth your, your mental health and your effort and, and in your time, right, which is the only commodity we can't get any more of. Um, and uh, I think it's really, really important that not only should we be focusing on trying to build inclusive teams, but also making sure that we're joining and working with inclusive cultures and people who are going to be passionate about those values. Because, you know, otherwise, you don't want to spend half of your effort fighting these values that you're not going to be able to change. You want to join forces with people who are going to think that way like you so you guys can be can just move at lightning speed. Dude, if, if folks take anything away, like, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. I mean you're definitely dropping some great career knowledge like and I can tell like you know we've been through the same journeys to some extent in that angle um you know definitely like you know doing that level of interviewing and just you know just being really honest with yourself right on what those values are that you're looking for and what that level of connection and um inclusivity that you're looking for and you know, sometimes like we do have the privilege to be able to interview at multiple places or not have a job for certain stands, right? And you know, like, you know, life is what it is. So, you know, also, you know, play to that piece as well. But definitely whatever ways you can find those organizations that bring in that level of inclusivity at the top is super, super like, like, like night and night and day difference. Yeah. It really is that in day. And I had a feeling like, you know, as, as I was bringing it up, because you were talking about it, that you were going to relate to that because we've been in the game now, you know, for quite a while. And I'm sure we've seen different cultures and, and 
and different things. But yeah, the, 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 that is that is I think the biggest takeaway that I can probably give someone. I tell it all the times culture starts at the top. Like if you really are concerned about you know whether or not you're going to be happy at a, at a new job or, or whatever, um, really really make that a part of your search because it can be very energy draining if it's something that you're going to put your heart and soul into. Which hopefully you know everyone gets an opportunity to, and you're right that it is a privilege. It absolutely is a privilege, and I feel very privileged that I can you know have the opportunities that I do and sort of like pick and choose you know you know where I work. Um, but I really do hope that as far as like you know when people think about where they're interviewing at, where they're hiring, where they want to work at, that you know. Um, the, the, where the demand is for people to want to work continues being these places that are becoming more diverse, more inclusive, you know, and building a culture like that from the very, very top. Cause I think that's really, really important. Yeah. And, and right. I think it's also leveraging that strength of our biculturalism, right? Like it's like as Latino Latinx individuals, like we're bringing in both like that sort of, even if you write, like, it's like, I wasn't born here, but it's like, I still consider I'm bringing in that American values system to some extent, but I have Absolutely. all of my Latinx values that I'm bringing into that too. And I mean, those are like superpowers being able to balance both of those out and sort of exist in these two spaces in a way that you're able to bring that into an organization and to have impact in connection to those value systems. Um, so, you know, just like hold that right close to your vest and close to your heart as you're doing these, the interviews and, and looking for companies that connect with you culturally, because it really is something that's going to be more valuable, like super valuable for them, even if they don't know it right now. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting too that, that, you know, um, that perspective that we bring, you know, sort of being, you know, being Latinx, but also growing up in, in the U S and, mm -hmm. and knowing what our parents and our, and our, mm -hmm. you know, our generations of parents and, and, and grandparents, like, you know, were thinking when they decided to come here. Right. Um, and, and what they value, you know, in, in, in the dream of this country, right. Which gets threatened all the time and still needs to be fought for it, which is, which is scary, but also, you know, important and, and, to, and to some degree motivating, right. That it is a fight that we all want to, um, go for. Yeah. And no, I know those auto turn off lights, <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah. So, you know, just thinking about, you know, how much I relate to, you know, what I think, you know, we can do here in, in, in this country when it comes to the, the sort of like alleged dream of, of what it can be. A huge part of it is diversity and inclusivity. And, and, and I try to, you know, balance that with, you know, the, the, the scary parts of what's going on in the news and, and just in general now, but also like, you know, the passion and excitement that I have about, you know, making great jobs for people and, and, yeah. and you know, what that, that passion just naturally comes from our being Latinx, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. Sazón que tenemos, you know. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> um, so the, the next Great. question here just was just on engineering being inclusive yeah. overall. Just as we're kind of like wrapping up mm. in the last fifteen minutes, yeah. and, and maybe we'll have some time for questions at the end. Um, but you know, I want to just kind of go back to that idea of um, you know being really good about um, yeah, ex exactly what Camilo is saying too. It's it's you know technology is, is all of ours, the responsibility of all of ours as people. And, and the more that diverse and more inclusive it is, the, the better it's gonna be and the safer the future of technology is gonna be, which, you know, Definitely. safety and technology is gonna be a bigger and bigger and bigger issue over the next couple of decades. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's, it's both exciting and, and scary at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so the more the more perspective, diverse perspectives that we have and the less divided we are as people worldwide, the more, yeah. the more success we're gonna have. And that kind of goes back into what open source has done, mm -hmm. right, for, for, for the world. Um, you know, bringing in people from all different walks of life, countries and experiences. And, and you're seeing a lot of open source projects actually prioritize inclusivity as part of like who's contributing to core um, and, and who's submitting pull requests. And I think the more that we can do for that, I think the, the better it's going to go. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, I, I would also say as far as like hiring and building teams, you know, one other big takeaway that I'd love for people to have, if you have the, you know, the, the ability to do this at your organization is, you know, make programs to hire entry level people make programs to hire entry level people you're going to create loyalties that are going to be worth way more than the one senior engineer that you can spend tens of thousands of dollars recruiting through your recruiter that may not even be really loyal to you they're just looking for their next you know not to judge anyone who's going through that you know on the other side but you know i think like the times that i've had juniors come in from boot camps or whatever that i've taken chances on and and it took a lot of work for me to find you know and interview people that were going to be good fits for what i was trying to build um, yeah. As far as like a culture and, and by culture, I mean, you know, like things like agile and, and being customer centric and people centric and like, you know, people who are going to care about the product that we're building because we were very small. Um, but once I have those that that if, if I can find that excitement and that empathy in people, the skill sets will follow. 
Exactly. And, and I have found that 99% of the time um, is that the skill sets will follow and they learn faster. And I get to, you know, I get very particular about my agile engineering, like, you know, things I get to mold them, you know, which is kind of fun to do. Um, yeah. And TDD and all the fun stuff that I care about. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it's also just very rewarding. So I, I would, I just wanted to add that um, as far as the inclusivity on building engineering teams. Go yeah. I, you know, like that, that totally reminds me of just the many, the, the many people that I've had sort of take that chance on me. Right. Like it's like, I have that super untraditional background, right? It's like, it's not super common for someone from ops to move into product marketing, to go into product management. You know, like, I mean, if I really wanted to, like I could start learning how to code and like try to become an engineer tomorrow, right? Like I could have that drive and that passion. And it's like, you know, like have, like it literally all it takes is for someone to give you that chance and opportunity because they see like what you're mentioning, Rick. It's not, it's less so about, the particular skill sets, but it's about sort of like, right, like that flavor and just like that um, way of relating to others, that way of, you know, um, sometimes even just like hard, like, like work, work ethic, yeah, right? To some absolutely. Extent. And just like the willingness, to like lean in um, that just, you know, you, you can tell like, okay, like I may have to spend some time like ramping this person up in certain areas, but like, they're going to care about what they're doing and they're going to care about the outcome of it. And they're going to take it on like really personally. Right. Um, and so, yeah, like I think yeah. when it comes to, to both being inclusive, like I would say like looking outside of like the traditional sets of skill sets, kind of like a little bit to what you're mentioning, Rick, the only second thing I'll add to that too is trying to do things where you're bringing in um, individuals of transitional age. So high school, college students, into your campuses and into wherever it is that you're working just to give them a different perspective of like, this is like where you can end up working if this is like where you wanna be, right? I do a lot of work related to that because especially um, both in New York when I was back in New York, but also here in San Jose, like there's like a lot of Latinx people who are being like right pushed out by all of the other tech individuals who are moving into the area and feel like yeah. they don't have a place in these tech companies. And from my mind, it's actually like, no, like we like we need y'all here. Like I need more people like me, more people not like me. I need that diversity here in order to be able to have like that that full frame of thought for whatever it is that we're building. Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up. I mean, you know, I went to um, you know, I see Camilla's in there, so I I gotta say, you know, we went to FIU together, go Panthers. Um and, and you know, it's, it's traditionally it's not a very like known school outside of like Miami and, and especially for tech, you know. But now that, you know, Miami is, uh, yeah, that's right, John. Um, now that, you know, Miami has all these tech people coming in, you know, you know, a lot of my big successes that people took chances on me, right? Like, you know, like even for my current job, like, you know, I didn't know this until I joined, but like, apparently I beat out people that went to Stanford and went to all these big schools. And, and, you know, and, and now I think, I, you know, I, I would like to think that I'm doing a more passionate job than I think anybody else would have done because like, you know, I have something to prove and, and they took a chance on me. And, and I think a lot of people in our community do have that. Um, so when people are, and I think about that a lot as people are moving to Miami, trying to do this whole, you know, tech revolution thing in Miami and bring people from New York and the Bay Area to Miami. What I worry the most about is that now the people that were growing up there, the, the Latinos and then the, the very diverse and everyone that's there, um, you know, culture are not going to get the same opportunities because now everyone's moving to Miami. So, you know, what I'm hoping is that, you know, FIU and UM and all these schools and Dade County, you know, Miami Dade College that are down there, um, you know, are able to solve for this problem. And they're going to need a lot of government help, I think, too, to make sure that the pipeline isn't just about, you know, external money and external people coming into Miami, but that these, 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 um, what the pandemic has done as far as like allowing people to work anywhere, it's just going to elevate communities as opposed to just like create the same bubbles, but now just virtual. Yeah, no, totally. Definitely making sure that we're contributing back to that pipeline, right, and sort of feeding back into it and supporting it. Um, you know, I, like I take that as a right of the work that I do day to day, like as a product leader and as a leader like in tech, like it's like, I take that on as like something that I know, like I feel like I need to contribute back to and be a part of. Yeah. Um, so we've talked a lot. I wanna, you know, just make sure that we have, um, you know, some uh, opportunities here at the end. If anybody wants to ask any questions or any particular topics they want us to dive into in this, this last little bit of time we've had. Yeah. And, you know, while, while we're waiting for that, like, I just want to say, Mike, it's been a lot of fun to talk about this. I feel like time has just flown. <laughs> hey, Mark, <laughs> yeah. passionate about this. <laughs> no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chat off, link, uh, off on LinkedIn and 
Yeah, exactly. It's exactly. kind of funny that we literally just to, just so everyone knows, we literally have not had a real conversation before <laughs> nine thirty Pacific this morning. <laughs> yeah. So shout out to to Alexis for you know for for putting us together. For real, for real. Yeah, thanks thanks to everyone who set this up, right? Um, yeah, I'll just I mean I'll shout out this like this sixth question that we had on here just because I did have some stuff around best practices for folks that want. Oh yeah, um, please. Takeaways, but yeah, like the idea is like, can you share some best practices on what every engineer and or product manager, no matter what level, should know about inclusive design? Um, I don't know if you want to kick it off, Rick, or I can go ahead and. Throw no, it sounds like you had some thoughts. Go ahead. Well, I well I also plug in my laptop here, and then yeah. I'll, I'll follow you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one is, uh, I mean, this isn't necessarily a, a any kind of framework or thought necessarily, but it's one, like, inclusive design and building an inclusive product, like, starts at, like, the ideation stage. If you're thinking about inclusivity, once you're starting to, like, hit code, like, you got to take a way step back and, like, really start at it from the front end of, you know, whatever um, methodology you follow for, for, for building. Um, that's one. Um, second is again, I'll say it again, like finding product market fit, like just Google that, like you'll come up with a ton of different frameworks. Um, it just gives a really great sort of focused way on figuring out who your product is meant for, um, and how to go about testing those assumptions. Um, one framework that I love using that is super easy to pick up and super accessible is the design thinking framework. It was developed at Stanford. All of the resources are open source, fully available. Highly recommend that for anyone who's just trying to do just like, even just like a, as, a, as a one person army, like you can start off like that with design thinking and get pretty far. Um, and I've seen it done in various different um, startup, startup spaces. Um, third with relation to inclusivity is having an advisory board. I know we haven't talked about this, and, you know, depending on the maturity level of your company, you may or may not be able to do this, but like having some kind of like inclusive advisory board where you have those different levels of identities and intersectionalities represented as users that you're going to and showing designs to getting user feedback from. And those are the folks you're able to tap into. Usually the sort of the process works as like you set it up on a six month to year basis. Then after that, you refresh the board every six months to a year as a way to, uh, you know, make sure you're getting um, diverse thought um, is also has played out really well in various places I've worked. The thing that I love setting up as a product manager initially, just to make it really easy to access users um, day to day. Um, the only last thing I'll, I'll note is internal dog footing. I know you kind of uh, noted a little bit to this, Rick, in relation to having folks internally that are diverse, right? In having that, also ensuring that you're doing that dog fooding and testing of your products internally at the alpha, beta, and throughout launch as a way to get the, have another angle of diverse perspectives brought into your product um, testing environments as well. Um, those are the ones that I kind of had top of mind that I really wanted to shoot out and get out to folks. Yeah, that is, that is such a good point about the internal like dog fooding, you know, and what we mean by that is like, you know, the, the phrase like eat your own dog food, right? Like, you know, really, you know, even if you're developing dog food, like you should be trying it as a human and making sure that it's something that, you know, you would eat, um, which I think I thought was a funny phrase to use also when I worked in food because I did work at a meal kit company. And, you know, <laughs> I, I always thought it'd be like, you know, it'd be like eat your own dog food, but wait, this is actually for humans. Um, and it is actually food. And, and, you know, it was really important to me that, you know, we had people who were at least trying out the product, using it, like, you know, feeling what it's like to be, to be a user um, is, is a great way to develop um, empathy. Um, because like, you know, we're, we're working so hard on building these things. And if we're not using them ourselves, then we can't really know whether or not, you know, from a, from a, just a, from a feeling even perspective of, of feeling if whether or not we're being successful at actually solving the problem. Um, and, you know, on that end of empathy, I, I think, you know, one thing that is a good skill to just like develop, and I know that Noelia had asked about, you know, potential books, um, is just getting really good at interviewing, getting really, really good at interviewing and, and getting really good at interviewing means not just, you know, having an agenda and like, you know, being all, all presentable and stuff like that. It's eliminating bias from the questions that you ask. It's designing questions in such a way that you're not leading the person that you're interviewing. Um, and there's dozens of other just things to think about that I'm not, you know, I wouldn't consider myself an expert and I'm sure you know way more than I do, Mike. Um, but there's a couple of resources that I've used and looked at in the past 
Um, the first one is kind of like a kind of like an obvious one or, or one that let people go to. It's the Lean Startup um, by Eric Reese is just kind of like a good go to primer on just like you know what it means to build a product based on user feedback and iterating quickly on it. So that's a great place to just start and and, and sort of be like a gateway into. Um, you know, the, 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 the many diverse ways of approaching problem solving in an iterative way. Um, another one that I haven't read myself, but has been recommended to me is called The Mom Test. And The Mom Test is supposed to be a book about, um, yeah, so it's supposed to be about basically like, you know, if you ask your mom, like, you know, like, you know, what do you think of my startup or what do you think of my product? Like, would you use it? Like, of course, your mom's going to be like, oh, my God, I love this. It's the best thing that's ever been invented. <laughs> so, you know, you don't. So that's something you don't want to talk to right, about or at least like interview in that in that sense. Um, and another one that's pretty good um, that I have read, it's called um, um, Talking to Humans, which is very short. And it's just like a good fun primer just on like interviewing and setting up your interview. And, and again, it's, it's really about, you know, putting yourself in a position to really explore how the, per how the user is thinking about, you know, this problem and how they feel about the problem being solved and, and the emotions they go through when they, when they face these problems um, and eventually get into, into that solution piece. So those are a few that I would, I would recommend is, is um, uh, the Lean Startup, the Mom Test, um, and then talking to people. And, and there are dozens, I'm sure, others that, that, that you know, you can share. I don't know if you have any, Mike, that you want to add to that list. Yeah, I think the, the two that came to mind immediately were the Cold Start Problem. Um, mm. it's, um, it's by in uh, look it up. Yeah, by, Chen. Um, yeah, and it's just, like, it's really great on just, like, right? Like, I mean, the Cold Start Problem is just, like, right, starting from scratch, starting from, like, zero, um, right? It's that angle of like, how do you try to kickstart something both like from like the most foundational possible level? Um, it just, it's just a really great book to just kind of like get in that headspace of testing assumptions and really understanding your market and how to actually go about um, launching really successful products and ecosystems. The second one um, is the design of everyday things. So I heard this on audiobook and it just like brings in such a, like foundational way of thinking about design. And it's like, and it's about design of like everything. Like light, they talk about light switches and TVs and all of that stuff. But so much of it is accessible and translatable to tech that um, I just, I, I really loved. And I honestly, I listen to it like every, every few years just to kind of like remind myself to like not get overburdened by all this like methodology and framework that we bring in day to day sometimes. And to really think of just like, the most simple foundational solutions for things um, for everyday problems. Awesome. Cool, that's great. I've added those two. I know the cold start problem, but the design of everyday thinking, I've added to my list. I'm really excited about that. Nice, same. Cool. Same. Well, thanks everybody. For those of you that are here, I hope you know we you have some couple takeaways and, and insights. Um, and I think we have our LinkedIn's published somewhere if you guys want to reach out to us. Um, and yeah, we hope you all enjoy the rest of the summit. Yeah, I was going to say same, you know, if y'all have any just immediate questions, feel free to reach out. I love mentoring, providing feedback on this stuff in whatever capacity I can. So yeah, feel free same. to do that. Yeah. Great. Cool. And Rick, reach out to me also on Slack. Yeah, yeah, that too. Yeah. <laughs> We're on Slack. We're on Slack. All right. Great meeting you, Mike. And uh, too, this was a lot of fun. Thanks, yeah, everybody. Enjoy Take care. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye.